Hello and thank you for joining us on Newsnight. I'm Neota Igbe. In northwest Nigeria, the complex interplay of development and insecurity has cast a shadow over the region's potentials. Its fertile land and vast resources stand in stark contrast to the deep-seated insecurity that has plagued its people. On the one hand, the region's agricultural potential is immense, with fertile soils and a climate conducive to club cultivation. Yet, the promise of agricultural prosperity remains largely untapped. Farmers are hesitant to till their land, fearing violence and theft. My guest, who started his life, his adult life, in his words, as a classroom teacher, believes the people of Northwest Nigeria can get a better life with homegrown security initiatives, including resolving the underlying factors like poverty, unemployment, and political grievances. Newsnight talks to the governor of Katsina State, Mr. Diko Rada. Your Excellency Diko Rada, thank you for speaking with us on Newsnight. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll start off for, I understand that you've, you've been in the business and the politics of Katsina State for a while. I mean, you were a local government chairman at a certain time. But tell, let's just tell our viewers, who is Diko Rada? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I don't have much history, but uh, I was born in my village, uh, one village called... Uh, High in Gada, in Dusama local government, and uh, I grew up in my village, and I went to public second, public primary school, public secondary school, public university, university. and all these things. And uh, I, I started my career as a classroom teacher. I was I was a classroom teacher for ten years, from 1989 to 1999. Uh, I did my first degree while I was a classroom teacher, but I joined uh, when I I finished my NCE, mm. and then uh, I did an N service. I was able to finish my university while I was a teacher, and then after that I did my service in Aview area. After which I enrolled for my master's degree in Aview area. In 1999, uh, I got appointment with the Pond uh, FSB International Bank. I was posted to Lagos. After some period, I was I was uh, I was sent to Kano State, and I worked at the Kano branch for a little over four years. Uh, in 2003, uh, the late President Er Aduawal, he was a governor. Uh, he appointed me as a caretaker committee of my local government. Then I was hesitating because uh, people felt that why should I come and take this temporary appointment when I have a good job at FSB and I have a good salary and what have you. But later I decided because all my life I wanted to serve people and that is the only opportunity you have to directly impact on the lives of the people. Mm. Because while I was in school, I have engaged myself in so many student activities, activism, and a lot of other things. And I have this mindset that things are not going well in our administrations. So I feel people that criticize need to come on board to see what they can offer. Having two former presidents from your state, how are you coping with that pressure? I mean, President Yaradu, bless the memory. Mm. President Muhammad Dubari, how are you coping with that pressure on you? You know, it is... And a former speaker, if I may yes, ask. Yes, but you know, it's only strengthening me. Mm. It's strengthening me because I know that all these big wit in the state are watching me. And the state have a lot of confidence in me. So I'm trying as much as possible to meet up to that challenge. So I'm working hard and they are inspiring me. Inspiring me in such a way that when you look at the lifestyle of General Muhammad Buhari, the former president, you would be impressed and you would be inspired because he has worked tirelessly for the nation. He was not concentrating on accumulation of wealth. He was trying to build the nation to the best he could. When you look at the life of the late Eradua of blessed memory, he has lived a life of honor. He has lived a life of service to the nation. And you know, all those big men that Katana has produced 
they, they serve as a source of inspiration to me because I'm trying to meet up to the challenges. I don't want them to call me one day and tell me that you are not doing it right this way, uh, you, where you have disappointed us in this or that. So I'm trying to meet up to the challenge. Because then it's a state of elites. There are a lot of people who have grown to so many levels within the public and private sector. So we are trying and we are tapping from their experience. And we are also going to tap information. We tap information from them and we keep going to them to find out if there is anything they see us doing wrong so that we can correct it. Mm. Obviously, you have, been, you have been in the business of serving your people from the local government as a teacher. And as a teacher, you served and became a local government chairman, caretaker and then chairman. Now, you have come into the seat. I mean, it's just about 100 days since you've been governor of Katsina State. So tell us, what did you see and what has it been like? You know, honestly speaking, uh, I may not say I'm just new to this business because I was a chief of staff to the governor, Masahari first tenure in office for about eight months before I was appointed by President Muhammad Buhari to take the leadership of Smeda. Okay, yeah. But, you know, I, was, I knew a lot of things that goes around within the state government administration. But it's not as good as when you sit on the seat. Because I became a governor. All my expectations were far beyond, or what I saw was far beyond my expectations. Because so many, there are so many informations that you may not be uh, opportune to have it if you are not a governor. Mm. So the magnitude of the issues and the problems and the challenges, you will get to understand it only when you get into the seat. But mind you, being at the corridor for a very long time, being a head of a federal government agencies have clearly shows to me that there is nothing fundamentally you are going to achieve in any system without making, coming up with a strategic policy, coming up with some reform agendas, because if you don't reform the system, if you don't uh, streamline the system and make it workable, there is no way you can make any meaningful achievement. And then, you know, when you get to the seat of a governor or a president or whatever kind of seat of this nature, if you are not careful, you will be drilled. You will just go offline from the initial plans you have to move your state or to move the, 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 the country. But luckily for us, almost a year, since when I start to nurse ambition to become a governor, I was planning that if I become a governor, these are the kind of things that I will approach. This is the kind of leadership I want to approach. This is my approach to leadership, sorry. So, 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 so that is why, that was what informed me. I believe you, me, before our primary election, I, was, I had my uh, strategic policy. I took some people, we went to Dubai, we spent over two weeks. Mm. We were planning on what do we need to do and what kind of reforms do we need to introduce. You know, virtually, if you didn't, inf if you didn't uh, provide uh, institutional uh, reforms, you may not likely achieve your goals as a governor because you may come with a laudable agenda because our problem in this country is not policy, is not strategy, is not anything, no. The problem we have is implementation of those strategies. And if you are not careful, you will just go offline and you may end up uh, not achieving what you intend to achieve. But there may be likely some issues that may come that may make, that may hinder yeah, 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 implementation of some of the strategic policy. But it is very paramount and important for anybody who is going to govern to make sure that about 70 to 80 percent of what he intend to achieve in the state, he was able to achieve that. Okay, so you came in there with a strategic plan. I mean, that's the small and medium enterprise development agency where you were looks at small and medium enterprises and how to build them and expand them in the country, the federal government agency. So definitely coming into um, Katsina will mean that these are some of the things, Katsina that is known for agriculture and small and medium enterprises, one will be expecting that we'll see some major things coming up in terms of industry, small and medium enterprises growing to be mega industries. We're looking forward to that, but let's see. 
on ground that you came in. You came with a policy to transform Katsina State, to move Katsina State to another level. Tell us how it's worked out so far. You know, it is very simple because even before we come on board as a government, I have already commissioned some legal expert to come up with some bills that we need to put in place for our reform to work. So before I came, before my swearing in, I already have some executive, some bills. executive bills that I would like to send to the State Assembly that will shape the way and the path for my administration. First of all, we had uh, this bill of Katana State Development Management Board. This development management is, is supposed to have to assemble global experts in development, in economics, in implementation of projects so that they will be responsible for monitoring and evaluating and planning our development projects in the state. And as well as the project that comes from the development partners, either through World Bank or any other development partners, so that they will monitor it to ensure that all, all the regulations, all the things that were put in place for the program to, 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 to take shape and to be implemented as at when you and to regulate and to open it and reduce leakages and also block all forms of leakages and make sure that we have transformed the system in such a way that it is going to be done and uh, time frame action plans are developed so that we monitor the activity of each key player in the different MDAs that we have will be able to checkmate them, know what they are doing, know the level of percentage of, uh, of, work, of, of work done, uh, so, so that we keep our eyes open on that. And then, uh, secondly, we also came up with what we call Katana State uh, Geographical Information System. Kajis, we don't have it in Katana State. The bill has been passed by the State Assembly already. I have signed it into law. We are trying to build up the GIS of, uh, functions of the of the agency, and I've, last week I have appointed the person to steer the, uh, the, the the development because what we are lacking in Katana as at now is we don't have a master plan. The master plan that exists in Katana has expired for the last thirty days, thirty years. So we have put expert in place to develop a master plan so that we can have a city that we can call a city and also plan it well for the future development of the state. Mm -hmm. You can't achieve that without having a law that has to do with that. In terms of agricultural development, we already understand that. Katana State is an agrarian state. It has over 90% of their population relying on agriculture. Also known for the growing of cotton. Yes, it is one of the largest producers of cotton. Right now, we have identified crops that have comparative and competitive advantage and also have potential for export. In that note, we were able to take a bill to the State Assembly to establish Katsuna Irrigation Authority. This Irrigation Authority will be saddled with the responsibility of reviving smaller irrigation and larger and medium irrigation scheme. Right now, we have put in place expert who are going to produce irrigation master plan for the state. And they have started working already on that. Because we want to keep our people busy for the whole year. We don't want them to just produce during the raining season for three to four months. And it was as a result of that redundancy and that period of redundancy that exists that create a lot of criminalities, people becoming uh, informant to bandit, People are engaging themselves in so many other things, but we want to keep our youth busy. Katana State Enterprise Development Agency, it will be saddled with the responsibility of developing macro, small and medium enterprises in the state because that is the only way we have and the window we have to, one, create employment to our youth, create wealth in our society, and reduce the level of poverty that exists within the system. Mm -hmm. So we have initiated a lot of these uh, 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 bills to the State Assembly, and once those bills are passed by the State Assembly, we will go into action. You know, you, you've, you've, you've 
from what you've said so far, you paint a picture of a man who would like to walk with the laws on ground, to set this, the ground for running real quick. So now you've set up the Katsina Development, uh, Katsina Development Agency, the Kajis for the, the geographical information system. You've also set up the investment arm of the Katsina State Government. If the bill is there and hopefully it will be passed. But you have certain crops um, that make, that, that stand out for Katsina. For instance, we you mentioned cotton earlier. There's also tobacco. There's also soybeans that are grown in large numbers in Katsina State. There's also livestock farming. That's another side of the Katsina business. Um, but all of this, again, was affected by insecurity. I mean, when the, previous, when the last governor was there, he kept talking about the fact that Katsina State needs help. So what's on ground now? How secure is Katsina State? You Besides know, creating the jobs for the youth to take them away from serving the bandits, what's you situation? know? I have since I have since understood that no one is coming to protect you. We have police, we have the military, but they are not enough to protect our communities. We have people scattered all over in the communities. In a local government, you hardly see a local government that have over 50 police officers in that local government. They can't even secure the headquarters of the local government. What more of the villages and the communities that are scattered within those localities? Mm. Katsina State has a population of over 10 million people. And you know we have eight vulnerable local governments. What I mean by eight vulnerable local governments, all eight, eight frontline local governments, I mean, they bordered the poorest directly from Jibia up to Savo local government. This is a length of over 200 to 300 kilometers span that we bordered the poorest. So our villages and communities are forest. They attack and go back. They attack and go back. There is no day you will not have an issue of kidnapping one person or killing a person in one place or the other. The only way, the only way we can stop that is when we have collaborative effort between the community and the conventional security officers. What do I mean by the community? The youths, there are various youths, you see a lot of youths in our communities that are willing to serve their people, but they are handicapped. Why are they handicapped? These bandits have motorcycles, they don't have these bandits have vehicles they don't have. These bandits have weapons they don't have. These bandits have training they don't have. So they are more vulnerable. Those are the only way you want to, if you want to, if you want to secure our communities is to engage the locals in two ways. Locals to protect themselves in line with the conventional security. Secondly, to engage locals in gathering intelligence because they know the movement of these people, they know their locations, they know their relatives. So immediately I was sworn in. I took a bill to the State Assembly to create Katsina Community Watch Corps. The bill has been passed. As at the moment I'm training about 1,500 uh, youth in Katana State in line with the conventional security agencies so that they can go together with the conventional security agencies to work out and protect their lives and properties. I have engaged I have, I'm doing the training together with the police and the army to those people mm. on way to protect themselves. We are going to provide them with all the necessary things they may require to protect themselves and to protect their families in line with those people. I have since authorized and approved about 7.8 billion naira to buy vehicles, to buy armored cars, to buy uh, motorcycles. I will invite you when we come to graduate these people. Because that's the only way. And these are the people, and they were screened 
from their ward level up to the local government level. We have designed a form that the village head must sign, a ward head must sign, the district head must sign, a local government chair must sign, DPO must sign to certify the character and those of those people that we are engaging. And we have since taken a biometric of all of them so that we reduce anything that may create any problem is, within the society. Is this not a way of instituting a state police? We are not instituting a state police, but rather we are engaging it to work with the security agencies to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. Because you cannot imagine in one local government you will find over 300 different communities in different cities. And in a local government, you have less than 50 police officers. How do you expect those police officers to devise and share themselves to protect those 300 localities within a local government? It's impossible, practically impossible. And I have mentioned it, I'm deploying technology mm. in tackling insecurity. There are a lot of technological things that we are employing and deploying to assist the security agencies to assist our community watch to be able to time to control the, the, the insecurity situation. Even if to not to reduce it to a zero level, to minimize it to the barest minimum, so that people can go to farm and farm and produce food. Because the level, the kind of situation and the crisis our people are, is quite sympathetic. And if you go there as a leader, and you can't do anything, is very unfortunate because you cannot fold your hand as a governor and allow people to be killing your people in the name of insecurity or in the name of state police or anything. No. So let me ask you, let me ask this question. If the National Assembly begins the amendment of the Constitution and they bring up a bill as regards the setting up of the state police, would you, would Katsina State be supporting that? I will be the first person to support it. Because I know how my people are suffering. I know the kind of situation I'm facing as a governor of a state. I will be the first person to support it. But I would love there should be a state police. But there should be some rules and regulation to guide the setting up a police of the state police. Mm -hmm. So that some governors don't use it for political which hunting of their opponent. Why would they want to do that? Okay, which hunting of their which opponent? Why would they want opponent? to do that when the state police... No, there may be some governors who may want to use the state police during election mm. to humiliate some people, to humiliate voters, to humiliate a lot of people so that they can take, they can have their ways. If you want to have your way as a governor, go and perform very well in your state. Go and be doing the right things to do in your state. You don't need to suffer yourself. People will vote for you. And even if people decided not to vote for you, so, so, so be it. The issue is come and do the things that the mandate has given you to do. Mm -hmm. Period of four years. If you are able to get the election, fine. If you are unable to get election, fine. But you should understand that a lot of governors, why they are not doing the right thing they are supposed to do is because they are thinking of re-election. Once you are thinking of re-election, you can't do right reforms. You can't do right policies and you can't do right things because you are thinking I may offend this or I may offend the other party and uh, they may come against me during the election. No, that shouldn't be the kind of leadership that we require in this country. The leadership we require in this country, if you are giving a mandate, come and do what is supposed to be right to the people, to the best of your ability mm -hmm. and leave the rest to God. You don't decide who will become a leader. It's only God who decide to who becomes a leader. Of the in, in interesting times, that, and the things you've talked about, really interesting. But let's step back a bit and look at the, what you mentioned earlier about the poverty level in um, Katsina State and what you're doing. Again, you've reeled out the things, some of the bills that you have put forward just so that to reduce the level of poverty and get the people back to the farm so that they can be sustainable in terms of food. But let's look at the investment. Uh, what, what's it like? I know that the insecurity situation might have scared the investors away, but what are you doing to get them back into it? You know, the only thing that we are doing to get investors back is building confidence. 
building confidence on the invested, on the sincerity of the government, on whatever they intend to do. First. Secondly, providing peace and security in the state is also one of the major priority of the government. That is why I said security, security, security is my first priority. And I've mentioned it without numbers that even if I'm going to spend the whole resources of the state to bring about peace in the state, I will spend it so that people can go to farm, so that people can go to school, so that people can go to the market. You know, without security, you can't invest anything. Without security, there won't be any economic prosperity in that place. So we are trying to restore security. And normalcy is starting to, re to, 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 to return to Katsina State. In, I'm not saying that there is no attacks. No, there are attacks almost on a daily basis. But they are coming in a pocket of two motorcycles, one motorcycle or three motorcycles to strike in one place and run away. Mm. Unlike before that they come about in mass with 200, 300 motorcycles to attack, uh, to ransack the villages and to do a lot of killings. But now it's a pockets of it they are doing. And those kind of criminal issues, you know, it takes time to eliminate all of them at once. But honestly, when you go to our cities, I don't think there is any place you will say that it has not, there was no production in Katana State. I was, I was in Pascara local government, I moved down last week, up to, up to Tandume local government, back uh, to Katana. But in all those uh, security affected areas, I've not seen a farmland that has not, uh, has, that has no plant on it. That people are not. So the people uh, are going back to their farms. Uh, people are going back to them back. And why it is difficult sometimes the military escort some of those people to the farm to do. But I cannot say that no, there are no insecurity. There are some places where farmers are having difficulties to go to the farm, or now they are having difficulties to even produce, to even harvest and bring back what they have produced. And we are making arrangement through the established, you know, we have established Ministry of Internal Security and Home mm. Affairs so that it takes charge of all the security issues in the state. So through the ministry and through the security agencies, there are some places we are providing some security personnel to protect those farmers to harvest their product and bring it back to their farm. Mr. Rada, you've talked about some of the things you've done. You've put out bills that hopefully the State Assembly will pass quickly. Some of them have already been passed and they've been signed into law. But you are a teacher, or you started as a teacher, and you said something. Even while you were in the classroom, you continued your education until you finished and then you were appointed. Not that you chose to, you were appointed. Even later, you now came on to stand for election. But let's look at education in Katsina. We do know that insecurity mm -hmm. not only affects the, the economy, it also affected the education system. Well, Nigeria has a large number of out-of-school children. But what are you doing about education? Can the children go back to school? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, uh, in Katsina State, uh, almost all our children go to school. I think we don't have up to 10 schools that children don't go to school in the whole of the state. But we know the educational sector in the state has decayed honestly. There are a lot of issues on grounds that we need to do to restate to restate the education. And the first thing I asked, I identified, and being a teacher and a professional one for that matter, and uh, I was able to understand that you cannot achieve anything meaningful in education if you don't have the teachers. You may have the buildings, you may have the everything, ACs, computers, but if you don't have the teacher, you don't have anything. So most of our focus in the reforms in education is on the teachers. We have just recently, last week, approved in the State Executive Council to employ, or we employed, we have approved the employment of 7,326 teachers in the state. For what level? Primary or secondary? Or Primary across? and secondary school level. Okay. Why? Because, but before we do that, 
have commissioned a committee to conduct examination on those young men and women. They conducted examination, they interviewed them, and after all those process, which the World Bank has even acknowledged, they, even, they were even represented, so we were able to screen and come up with this figure. Okay. And soon we are going to provide them with their opus of appointment into the service. This is one of the major reforms. Unlike well, like before, you just employed, you allocate employment to government functionaries, to stakeholders, and every other uh, uh, stakeholders in the state that bring 10, bring 5, bring 20 to employ. But this time around, we say we will never joke with the education of the state. And we will not politicize education for whatever reason. We will do the right thing, genuinely, and you will have opportunity to everyone to get employment without coming from anybody. So we have opened the system, whether you are a son of a poor or a rich, an elite or a politician, it doesn't matter. If you are qualified, we examine you, we interviewed you, and we screen you for employment. Final. We have deviated from the fact that all those things influence employment into the teacher profession. Not only in teacher profession. We want to reform the public service as well. We employ people based on merit. We promote people based on merit. For the first time, that was what we did in the state. When I came on board, we have sacked all the permanent secretaries. We have asked every qualified director and those that existing permanent secretaries to sit for examination. Hmm. We brought consultants and they did examination for them. And after the examination, the best ones, we employed them. We gave them, we, we appointed them as permanent secretaries in the state. So any other promotion in the state has to be examination based. We just don't promote people to position without being going undergoing all these things. Mm. So in education, that was what we started. But, but and if I, secondly, if I may come in here, you've employed over seven thousand. What about the welfare? Their welfare package, their salaries. What has that? You been know, when we did analysis, we found out that we have we have manpower gap in the education sector. There are a lot of manpower gaps in the education sector. You go to a school, you find out that you have only one, the headmaster and one other teacher. So the first thing you need to do is to employ. When you employ and bridge that gap, then you start talking about what incentives do we put in place to encourage these people to perform more. And that depends on the resources of the state. But for now, we say that let's abandon everything, let's employ so that we fill that gap. Once the gap is filled, we have teachers in schools, then we can now come back and sit and say, okay, then they are on ground now, they are on seat and they are qualified. Then let's do something to provide uh, welfare to encourage them to do. We will, we will think about maybe if the resources allowed of introducing a rural allowances to teachers, those that were posted to the rural areas so mm. that it argument the suffering of staying without some basic infrastructures in some places or some basic amenities in those places. So, but we have not reached there. What we want to do now after this employment, we are going to train all the teachers in the states, which are over 20 something thousand, 25,000. We'll train them, retrain them. We'll train the trainers, and the trainers will pick one teacher from each of the over 2,000 schools that we have. And then we train those teachers. They'll go back and train others. And after the training, we'll conduct examination for them. And then another time, we'll train them and conduct examination. And another up to three times so that we'll make sure that those teachers that are teaching our kids have the qualification have the knowledge, have the ability to impact knowledge to those children. But in a situation whereby the teacher doesn't have the mastery of the subject matter, the teacher doesn't know what he's doing, the teacher can't teach very well, then what is the essence of the teaching? What is the essence of building the school? Hmm. And apart from that, 
Recently, on my 100 days in office, we have laid foundation for the, for the construction of 75 new schools, new junior and secondary schools across the state, so that we reduce the distance covered by the children to go to schools, to make it that within five kilometers uh, radius, in those communities, they will have maybe junior and secondary school or primary and junior secondary schools where their children can go and have education. And next year, in the second phase of the Agile project, we are going to also construct 75 additional schools to, uh, in, in, in the states. And apart from doing that, we are trying to provide, uh, right now, under the state, ministry, state, uh, state uh, primary education board, we are constructing rehabilitating and providing furniture, toilet and water in about 361 primary schools across the state. In just our 100 days of office, we have approved the, the award of those contracts to, 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 to develop the sector. But the issue is we are putting all our energy on the manpower, on the teachers, because we can have all the infrastructures in the world if you don't have the teachers, you may not be able to achieve anything. Mm. Education is not something that we are going to joke about. And recently, when I came on board, I realized that students that are in the tertiary institution for two years, they were not paid scholarship. I have approved the payment of 600 million last two weeks for the payment of student allowances for the year 2022 and the year 2023. Yes so that the student, because in some of the higher institutions of learning outside the states, they have increased their school fees, but the payment of the scholarship will augment and help the parent to be able to pay us at Wendy the payment of the school's school fee uh, of their children in those schools. And then we are also trying to look at the, 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 the there are a lot of gaps most of our pupils in the secondary school and primary school, they were sitting on ground for their school. So yeah, when yeah. I analyze that, we have a gap of over 1 million pupils that doesn't have a seat in the state, among the over 2 million uh, pupils that we have in this primary school. And when I did my analysis, uh, to buy furniture for 1 million people, you may require up to about 20 billion naira to do that. That is just for the furniture. We are not talking of the money you will pay for the employment of the teachers. We are not talking about building the infrastructure. We are not talking about the repair of the infrastructure. So the demand in the educational sector of resources is just too high. Mm -hmm. But we will try as much as possible to do it step by step. And as I promised during my campaign, that I'm going to build three model schools, three model schools in three senatorial zones of the state. The essence of building those model schools is to provide opportunity to the children of the poor who don't have money and the resources to take their children to the best schools. Let me ask you here, one would think that Katsina having produced two presidents would not be having issues with education, like mod in terms of building model schools, for instance. And I do believe that under President Goodluck Jonathan, there were some schools that were, not one or two special schools that were built in Katsina as well. What happened to all of them? No, there's, uh, they are not. I think it's, you are talking about Durham Jonathan. What happened was they built some Angaya schools yeah. for Almagiri. Yeah. And those schools have not taken off properly as it was planned. And then uh, I didn't do a lot of work on that to find out much details about those schools. But uh, because we are so overwhelmed with other issues that are on ground, but we will look at that. But these special schools, as I want to tell you, is they are meant for the children of the poor. Why I say that? If you go to our villages today, you find there are brilliant children, but because their parents are poor, they may not have opportunity to go to school, and a good school where their talent can be utilized for the benefit of the state. So with these special schools, we are opening opportunity for those kind of brilliant students in the state to have, to, we provide everything that is required in those schools. 
and a child is just supposed to go with just his shirt and trousers and maybe his clothes mm. but he doesn't need to do anything he doesn't need to pay anything we will provide it for the four and the admission in the school will be purely on merit mm. we will conduct examination in those places those children who are able to pass those examinations they will be taken to those schools why i'm trying to do that is because myself and other elites other politicians in the state they can take their children to any school of their choice and they can pay whatever amount of money to get any quality of education they may want their children to have but the child in the poor doesn't have that opportunity but he may be so brilliant more brilliant than our children but will we have the opportunity to do that but they don't so why can't as a government provide that kind of opportunity to the children of the poor so that they should also have opportunity to be whatever they may be they may be or whatever god wants to make them to be mm. uh, as any other child and it's purely a merit yes yeah, so let's begin to wind down and look at this matter of the economy in katsuna state again right now uh, subsidy on petrol has been removed and it's affected practically everything fuel price is up there and it's affecting even the cost of the locally produced foods so that now the federal government says we're giving five billion to each state with two billion already released would that in any way make a difference no yes but you know uh, it's just a temporary measure giving palliative to the citizens is a temporary measure so what would be the permanent one for instance the permanent one is to create opportunity for them to do a lot of business in the state to do a lot of things to farm to be able to produce the agricultural, agricultural value chain, value chain uh, msme development these are the kind of things that you do to create wealth but providing a, a bag of rice or half rice half bag of rice or one major of rice it doesn't help it does it may give immediate relief and i think what the government did was to give immediate relief to the situation the people are facing now in the state we did it in kazan state even before the federal government has given us palliative we i have approved uh, over 2 billion naira to buy grants from the local governments so that they can share to the needies and the poor and the second segment of it was also done which i personally went and and, and distribute to the most vulnerable women orphans and children and the elderly who don't have any support from anywhere and we will continue with that throughout the 34 local governments of the state as a temporary major to cushion the effect of the subsidy removal but the permanent effect the permanent way to cushion the effect is creating business opportunities creating value chain in agriculture creating and helping the msmes startups and the existing businesses so that they can also create wealth for themselves and me to get the effect of the removal of subsidy mm. into the system you mentioned something earlier about with the resources that when the resources are available the question of internally generated revenue for katsina state for instance how is that working out how what's what's the strategy what strategy are you putting in place to ensure the revenue generated in katsina is increased and then used for the good of the you state? know uh, that one has also been given a lot of attention because uh, what we are trying to do now is to block the leakages and create a lot of transparency and uh, accountability in the system that was the reason why i signed an executive order for the implementation of the tsa in the state mm. so we are now we have set up a committee to make sure that tsa is well implemented and used in the state one of the way to block leakages and also to create transparency and we are at today trying to improve or enhance or structure our public procurement department so that we can have a pricing unit and a whole of other expert into the procurement unit so that we can block leakages that may arise through contracts awards and the rest of it this is another thing and then we took a bill the revenue bill back to the state assembly for some amendment so that we can amend it allowed us more powers to collect revenue on behalf of the government and the people of Kasana state from those that deserve to pay the priority. especially we are giving priority to the most uh, uh, 
um, uh, the, 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 the high profile individual in the state who are supposed to have been paying revenue but they are not paying revenue that they are supposed to have been paying to the state. We will not add more hardship on the very lower people on the pyramid. We will as much as possible concentrate our revenue collection on those people that are supposed to have paid revenue, this and that, but they are not paying what they are supposed to do. First of all, you must mandate your revenue board to ensure that they did a, a audit, uh, what do you call it, you did a tax audit on individuals so that we will be able to know exactly what you are supposed to have been paying to the state or whether you are meeting of those obligations or not. And then once this law is passed into the into law by the state assembly we will have the power to now implement the collection of revenue uh, appropriately as it's supposed to be in the state so that we can generate revenue. Our target is if we can be able to generate revenue within these four years of our administration to be able to pay salaries of our workers without waiting for the allocation from the federal government. That is what I'm targeting and I pray and hope that God will allow us to achieve that target and we will work towards achieving that target with the, with the support of the people and with the support of Almighty God. Finally, Your Excellency, Katsina State has some traditional handicrafts that are popular. I mean, I visited Katsina and things like the Durba, all those cultural activities. Um, are you looking at tourism and how would you encourage those creating those traditional handicrafts to even do more? Yes, you know, because of the importance of tourism and development of our handicrafts in the state, we are now appointed a PhD holder who is very versatile in the field of tourism and cultural development in the state. And he has since produced a blueprint which, if the state government implement it, will be able to have a lot of, will generate more revenue. And the Doba in Katana happens to be one of the best Dovas in the whole of Nigeria. But with over time, it has been degenerating. Uh, to, 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 to not as, 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 as it was before. But we are trying, I've just started discussing with the two Emirate Council to see how the government can come in to improve on that aspect so that we can attract a lot of foreigners, a lot of investors to come to Katana. As a result of those festivities, they may be able to see areas in which they can make some investment in the state. So we are focusing on that in the other hand, but you know we are overwhelmed with the issue of insecurity in the state. So most of our concentration is put on that direction so that you can have meaningful tourism in the state without securing the state. Mm. So we are trying as much as possible to also look at that aspect and work has begun has begun on the on the on the on, on the issue. Mm. And we are working on that uh, honestly. If you had a word for people who are concerned about visiting Katsina State, what would you tell them? Tell them that they should come to Katsina. Just tell them. They are no, listening. I'm telling them they should come to Katsina and Katsina is ready for them and Katsina will provide all the legal backing to let them work for the development of the states and also to invest and they will have my backing, the government backing and there will be some legal frameworks that will protect investors in the state. And we are looking on to investors to come, that the state is going back to its track, and we are in the process of reforming a lot of issues and making the state stable and peaceful for anybody to come and provide whatever services he may wish to provide or to do any business he may wish to bring to the state. Our doors are open. You can knock at my doors 24 hours. I'll be ready for you. Thank you very much, Excellency. Thank you so very much. Thank you. My pleasure. And that's our program today. We would like to hear from you via our social media handles. They're right there on your screen. You can also listen to this and previous episodes of this program via our podcast. Visit our website, channelstv.com forward slash podcast to get started. I'm Nell Taibbi and I look forward to hearing from you. Bye-bye. Thank you.